salvation from hell is, by definition, most critical. Because if you have a perfect life or an evil life or anything in between and die and go to hell fire and then to the great white throne judgment and then to be cast in the lake of fire, what good was your life? It was nothing. You've lost your own soul. Everything is just worthless. So you must understand how to have all of your sins forgiven and how to be justified in the eyes of God. They're one and the same. When you have all of your sins forgiven, God will justify you. He will impute unto you his righteousness. That's the whole purpose of the book of Romans in the first four chapters where the Apostle Paul explains how the gospel of God in verse 1, the gospel of God, he says in verse 17, for therein, in this gospel of Christ, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. You need the righteousness of God given unto you, which is the forgiveness of your sins and so much more. But just understand, you need all of your sins forgiven. So I'm going to show you and teach you a right from God's book, the first four chapters of Romans, and how you can know for certain all of your sins are forgiven and you're justified in the eyes of God. And once you hear this truth, you have the option to believe or not believe. Free will choice. Romans chapter 1, as we start to go through this gospel of God, he starts with evil tidings. And he's going to explain these evil tidings to you so that he makes sure that you understand and that your eyes are going to be open and so that you turn. You turn, as Paul said in Acts chapter 26, the Lord Jesus Christ said to Paul to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins. So God lays it out very simply for you, starting in Romans chapter 1. So as you listen to these evil tidings, it's sort of like you want to check your understanding and your faith and your beliefs in the things that God is going to tell you. And anywhere along this path of learning of the truth, if you don't believe it, it's over for you. It, 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 just, it will all come to a screeching halt. You must believe everything that's going to be told unto you. It's very simple. Romans 1.18 for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So let's start first learning about the God of the Bible. And there's, a, there's wonderful truth that you hold regarding the God of the Bible, your creator, but you hold it in unrighteousness. You're not holding that truth in faith and believing you're twisting it. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. God is manifested in you. In you. This truth. For God hath showed it unto them. And he's going to show it unto you through creation. But never forget the issue here. As verse 18 said, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against God's wrath ultimately is the lake of fire and brimstone that you will go to when you reject his truth. So you need to, I'm warning you, pay attention because it's your soul. Creation speaks of these wonderful things, verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from what? The creation of the world are clearly seen from the beginning of time, being understood by the things that are made. You understand by the things that are made, the trees, the sky, the sun, the moon, the stars, the, the mountains, the seas, the many seas. From the things that are made, what do you get out of that? Even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. You know that God has eternal power over you because he's the creator and you are not. You were born, you will live in his creation, his created world, and then you will die. So how powerful are you when you'll never escape death? 
so that they are without excuse. And he has Godhead authority over you. Not only eternal power, but Godhead authority over you. He's God. You are not. Because that, when they knew God. So you knew the God of creation. They glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful. You didn't give glory unto God and credit unto God as your creator. If you did, good. But neither were thankful. Have you been thankful every day you've existed, you've existed and lived on God's earth? That he gave you life and breath and all things? And you live on his earth? By his allowing you to live on his earth? Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Vanity is no good. Vanity cannot deliver you. There's no profit in it. And in your imagination, if you started to change the God of the Bible because of creation into a God of your own imagination, that is vanity, and their foolish heart was darkened, you wind up with a dark, foolish heart. No light, no understanding, just a foolish, dark heart. Professing themselves to be wise... They became fools. You're either wise or you're a fool. A wise person hearkens unto this great book in my hand, the mighty King James Bible, because it is the word of God. A wise person will believe what the Bible is saying. A fool, in this passage, rejects the God of the Bible, even though creation speaks of him so clearly. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice the heavens is not heard. You know that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. You know he's the creator. But... So many of you professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. You know why these fake churches, the, the Roman Catholic Church has statues. I was a Catholic for years. You know why they have all their statues in there with mouths that speak not, eyes that see not, ears that hear not, hands that touch not, feet they have, they can't walk, they're nothing, they're lifeless, images of stone and wood. You know why they have those images made like the corruptible man? Because that image doesn't condemn you to hell. That's what man does. He they change and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. You start worshiping the creation and the wicked evil one who's behind all of this trickery that's tricking you. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. You know what? I don't know what you understand about the God of the Bible, but this Bible is clear that if you want to just worship creation and all of the things of man and birds and beasts and creeping things that man makes as idolatrous, goofy statues that you think are holy, you want to worship that, God gives up on you. Wherefore, God also gave them up. He's not going to chase you. you. You just go worship your idolatry. And when you die, you'll be in the flames of hell. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie. That's what you did. You took the truth of God as creation speaks of God and you changed it into a lie, into worthless statues of everything from man, birds, beasts, and bugs. That's your fault who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature. Singular, that's Satan. Satan tricked you through all of his evil, wicked wiles to get you to worship man, statues of man, images of man, birds, beasts, and bugs. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature, that's Satan, more than the creator. That's God, who is blessed forever. Amen. Watch God give them up again and give you up again if you're doing such foolishness. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. And watch what God calls 
a vile affection. Romans chapter 1, verse 26. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. That's women with women. That's called vile in God's eyes. That is when a woman has an affection towards another woman. Physically, God calls that vile. Not an alternative lifestyle or born that way or freedom. Yes, you have freedom to do so, but it's called vile by God. Now, who do you think is going to win that one? You want to be stubborn and hold on to your vileness, women with women? God wins in the end because you die and then you pay for that. Verse 27, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, of the woman. So what does a man do? He leaves the natural use of the woman, and he's attracted to another man. They're called sodomites in the Bible. Watch what these men do. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly. Not only is it vile, it is unseemly. And look at what they get, these men. And receiving in themselves, they get something in their own bodies, that recompense, it's a payback of their error, not alternative lifestyle or wise choice or just made that way, of their error, which was meat, it's fit. Something happens into the bodies of men who are men with men, doing vile, unseemly acts. It gets even worse. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. You see, no man with a man, no sodomite, or no vile woman with a vile woman wants to retain the God of the Bible in their knowledge because they can't enjoy their sin. Because the God of the Bible is a living God, not some statue. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over. So he gave them up, gave them up gave them over to a reprobate mind. You know what a reprobate mind is? One that doesn't want to have God in it. They don't want to retain God in their knowledge from the natural thing. This You don't even have to have a Bible. They don't want to retain the God of the Bible in their knowledge, and that's called a reprobate mind. Why? To do those things which are not convenient. Man wants to go sin, and in order to enjoy his sin, he has to get rid of the God of creation who put internal witness into him, man that is, of who he is, the God of the Bible. Now, this is the evidence. God is going to give you a list of sins in Romans 1, 29, 30, and 31. Chapter 1, verse 29, 30, and 31. God is going to list for you a list of sins. This is the evidence against you. These are the crimes that you are going to be charged with. And if you've done one sin on this list, the Bible says, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Physical death and the second death, the death of your soul, cast into the lake of fire. Listen to the list of sins, remembering, what James chapter 2 verse 10 says about this list of sins because the doers of the law are going to be justified, not just hearing it. But if you've done one sin one time, James chapter 2 verse 10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. If you've done it, offended God in one point. See, you offend God when you sin. You thumb your nose at him and you just want to go sin. Listen to the list, verse 29 of Romans 1. Being filled with all unrighteousness. Have you ever done something not right? Mm -hmm. I have. Fornication. Any sexual act outside of a lawful marriage bed. Have you ever done that? You're guilty. I have too. Wickedness. Have you ever done anything just pure wicked? I have. Covetousness. Have you ever desired something God said don't desire? You're guilty. Maliciousness. Just plain downright mean and done something. You're guilty. Full of envy. Murder. Debate. Have you ever argued with God in the Bible? 
That's debate. Malignity. I'm sorry, deceit first, then malignity. Have you ever deceived someone? Have you ever maligned someone, spoken evil about them, things that are not true, maligning their reputation? Whisperers, little gossipers, boasters, inventors of evil things. Look at this one, disobedient to parents. If you have disobeyed your parents, you are guilty and you're worthy of death. Without understanding. You know why without understanding is a sin? Because if you don't understand the Bible, it's because you don't believe it. Therefore, it's called sin in the eyes of God. You see, it's not good that the soul be without knowledge, the book says. Ignorant people go to hell fire. Ignorance of these things is no defense. Covenant breakers. You've broken covenants, agreements, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. If you've done one sin on that list, you are guilty. And just if you're so foolish and deceived to say you've never done any of these sins, how about this? The thought of foolishness is sin, the book of Proverbs says. If you want to look it up, it's chapter 24, verse 9. The thought of foolishness is sin. The thought of it. So don't tell me you've never sinned. You know you have. And because you have sinned, one time you've offended God and you're guilty of breaking the entire law. God says, who knowing the judgment of God in verse 32, you know you're going to face God in judgment when you die. You know it. That they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. You find pleasure with others who are sinning with you. Death in the Bible, there's a first death. It says in Hebrews chapter 9, very simply, and I know everybody understands this, but this is the verse that confirms it unto your brain. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment, you have an appointment at the funeral home with the undertaker. You're going to die. But then the Bible talks about the second death, the death of your soul. And in Revelation chapter 21, let's see this second death. Verse 8, but the fearful and unbelieving, that's you, and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, that's you, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's where you're going. The second death. The death of your soul is in the lake of fire. Now, back to Romans chapter 1 again, verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, first and second death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Two deaths you have to look forward to. Physically, and then the second death, you're going to be cast into the lake of fire, and you're going to burn there forever and ever in the torments of those flames because of your transgression and your sins against God. Romans chapter 2 now goes on to explain how this great white throne judgment is going to function just before God cast you into the lake of fire. Romans 2, 1, Therefore thou art inexcusable. Oh, man, you don't have an excuse anymore. I just told you and showed you and proved from the scriptures alone that you're a sinner. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O oh man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, as you were thinking about other people, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. So when you were thinking about other people who were sinning, you were doing the same thing. You just condemned yourself. Now, verse 2 starts how this great white throne judgment is going to function. Remember, you've already been proved to be a sinner in chapter 1. He listed the crimes you've done. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Truth will be the issue. Truth. That one word is going to then go against you because being a liar and not following truth and obeying the truth, you're going to come face to face with the God of truth 
And that's going to be the issue at the great white throne judgment. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Let me read you about this judgment. It is found in Revelation chapter 20 in sixth grade English in the King James Bible, verses 11 through 15. Hearken unto this judgment of God. Here's the event itself that Paul's talking about, our apostle in Romans 2, 2, this judgment of God. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, that's going to be you, small and great. I don't care who you are, if you were a nobody in this world or if you were a big somebody, small and great, stand before God. So dead people are going to stand. doesn't mean you're snuffed out. You're facing God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Everything you've ever said, thought, or have done. God has written down, and he keeps perfect 24-7, 365 days a year records. You're not going to get out of this. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now watch how simple this is. And I'm warning you here with everything that is in me. This is how serious this is. It is in sixth grade English. Don't dismiss it. Don't just not believe it. Because if you don't believe what I'm telling you, there is no hope for you. There is no remedy. You're just biding your time. You're treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath. And you're going to go to hell. I am telling you the seriousness and the simplicity of Revelation 20 verse 15 cannot and should not be ignored. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. If your name's not written in the book of life, you will be cast into the lake of fire. Whether you believe this or not isn't going to change the truth that it's going to happen. I warn you, you need your name written in the book of life. Back to Romans chapter 2. This judgment day facing God at the great white throne judgment is going to be according to truth. Verse 2 again, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. The things that I just listed for you in that list of sins. And God has a question for you now and so do I. And thinkest thou this, O man, are you thinking this about now? That judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Do you think you're going to escape? The earth and the heaven are going to be burnt up. Where are you going to go? You're going to have just yourself in your soul, your nakedness of your soul. You're not even going to have a name anymore. And you're going to stand before God with no Savior, no one to help you. And you're going to give account for your sins because the great white throne judgment is a sentencing trial. It's not there to see whether you can squeak into heaven or not. Or that you did enough good to outweigh your bad. It is a sentencing trial. And if you've done one sin, you're going to be found guilty. And your name is not in the book of life. And you're going to be cast into the lake of fire. So I can imagine at this point, you might be thinking, how can I escape this? But don't think that. That's foolishness. Because you're going to die. And your soul is going to be housed in hellfire waiting for this day, this great white throne judgment. Don't... I'm begging you, don't do this. Don't think you're going to escape or close the Bible. You don't want to hear it. A fool would do that. I'm going to show you at the end how you can have all your sins forgiven, but you're never going to get saved from hell until you understand that you're going there. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? God's goodness. 
that he allows you to live on this earth. He allows you to exist even though you're sinning against him daily, even though you're an enemy of God, of God by your sin, even though you may be involved in churches and all these things, but you're fake, you're phony, you don't understand this, you're doing works to be saved. You think you're saved, you're not, you don't even have the word of God, you don't understand anything. Listen, God's goodness lets you live here because he's not willing that any should perish. He wants you to repent, and all that means is to change your mind. Quit fighting the Bible. Quit fighting truth. If you fight truth, you're going to lose. Repent. Change your mind. But this is what you're really doing, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart. You see, you won't change your mind. You know what happens then because of your hard and impenitent heart, one that won't change your mind and believe the Bible? Treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath. All you're doing is storing wrath against the day of wrath. That's what you're treasuring up. Treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath. That's a day of wrath. It's not a guilt or innocence trial. You're already been found, you already have been found guilty, we're going to see in chapter 3, verse 19. You're already guilty. Guilty. It's a day of wrath. No mercy, no grace, no peace, no joy, no happiness. You're going to face an indignant holy God who created you, who you have rebelled against and have never believed what he's told you to believe. You believe stupid preachers out there who don't know what to believe. Treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath. It's a day of wrath that day and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. It's going to be revealed one day and it's going to be a righteous judgment of God. Listen to me. God is right when he throws you into the lake of fire. You deserve it. I deserve it. He's right. Who will render to every man according to his deeds. God is holy. And when you sin against him, his holiness is offended. His justice will demand payment, that first and second death, and you will be cast into the lake of fire. You will experience his wrath. And listen, if you want to reject all this, if you don't want to believe it, if you want to just try to be good to get to heaven, okay, let me show you the standard then. Here's the standard if you want to reject what God's going to offer to you. If you just want to do it your way, if you just want to be good to get to heaven, listen to the standard. Here it is in Romans 2, starting in verse 7. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, God will give you eternal life. If you can demonstrate at the great white throne judgment that your life was one patient continuance, patient continuance, never stopped in well-doing. All you ever did was well, well-doing. The whole time you were seeking for glory and honor and immortality, God will grant you eternal life. He says it another way in verse 10, but glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good. If you can just show that your whole life, all you did is work good. You never broke his commandments. You just did good. You worked good. To the Jew first and also to the Gentile, God will give you eternal life. That's the standard. So if you want to reject truth, if you want to reject God's salvation, then you're going to, ha you're going to have to prove that your life was one continuance and well-doing, that the entire time you just worked good, the entire time of continuing and well-doing, you were just seeking for glory and honor and immortality. God will give you eternal life. Your whole life was one of just doing good works. Then God will give you eternal life. But remember, if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you're guilty of all. But God is just. He's fair. Because if you've never sinned, you don't need a Savior then he'll give you eternal life. The very fact that everybody dies proves that everybody sinned. But, verse 8 now of Romans 2, but unto them that are contentious. See, if you want to argue with the Bible and do not obey the truth, you don't want to obey what's going to be offered to you. You want to disagree right here. You don't want to obey the truth. You don't want to change your mind. You don't want to believe that you're treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath. 
but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. You want to obey sin? You're going to get four things from God. Indignation. He will, he, he will be burning with his anger when you face him. And wrath. That will be the effects of his anger. As you hit the lake of fire, you're going to know the wrath of God. And then two things are going to happen to your soul. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. Of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. That's right. Tribulation and anguish, the highest form of agony and pain that can ever be experienced by any man, woman, or accountable child, you will have forever and ever. But I say again, but glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good. So if your whole life is one of work good, of working good, doing good works, don't worry about it. To the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. There is no respect of persons with God. I don't care who you think you are. When you face them in judgment with nothing but your soul. Standing there, you, that's what you are. Man's a living soul. You're a soul. And it's never going to be snuffed out. You will find out that God doesn't have any respect for you. Rightfully so. Do you know why? You never had any respect for him or his laws. Now watch how this is going to take place. For all of you who have said, well, I've never even read the Bible. I don't know. All the people who have never even read the Bible or may have read the Bible, watch what's all these little things happen in your mind throughout your lifetime. Watch how God's going to get you and hold you accountable for your sins. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. So you, you don't even need a Bible to perish. You say, I never had a Bible. You're still going to perish without the written laws because you have laws built into you. And as many and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. And for those who not only have laws written in you, for those of you who have Bibles, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Notice judged. Not forgiven. Not granted mercy. Judge. Now watch this. How is that going to take place? For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Now think. Watch how simple this is. You know who's going to get justified according to God at the great white throne judgment day? The doers of the law shall be justified. But you have to prove that you did the law. If you did the law, you kept the law, you didn't break his commandments, you will be justified there. But remember, the doers of the law shall be justified, but in James chapter 2, verse 10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So if you've broken one law, you're guilty of breaking the entire law. So don't forget the doers of the law shall be justified. So unless you can prove that you've done God's laws your entire life, work good, always continuing in well-doing, seeking for glory and honor and immortality, then you'll get eternal life. But you're going to have to prove that. And you're not going to lie and fake God out here. He knows everything you've ever done, said, or thought. He knows what your thoughts have been your entire life. And the thought of foolishness is sin, Proverbs 29 24 verse 9 says. But the doers of the law shall be justified. Now watch this. For when the Gentiles, that's just the word for the nations of the world. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, they didn't have the written laws, do by nature the things contained in the law. You just by nature did things like thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. You did these things just naturally. These, these Gentiles, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. God is written in your hearts. That's your mind, not your beating muscle in your chest. That's your hearts and minds right up here. God has written in your hearts some of his laws. You see that? Which show the work of the law written in their hearts. So you know some laws. Watch what happens then. God gave you a conscience. 
their conscience also bearing witness. So when you've broken God's laws, your conscience bears witness to that. And their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. That's what your thoughts do. They're either going to accuse you and find you guilty or they're going to excuse you. And you're still guilty. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, Paul's gospel. You're going to be judged by God and he's going to judge the secrets you have up here that only you know. You can't hide from God and everything's coming out. These little times when you've sinned, you've broken his laws, you know you have, your conscience bore witness and your thoughts then either accused you or excused you. Either way, you're guilty. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Now, if you, that is for everybody on this earth, Jew or Gentile, the things I've just told you. But if you're a Jew, a real Jew, one who has the blood, the physical blood of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob running through your veins, if you're one of the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel, who, in time past, are God's chosen people, to, and they still are in the sense of he's going to finish some things with them. But if you're a Jew today, things are even worse for you. Not only do you have everything I just said against you, because it's for the Jew or the Greek, the Gentile nations of the world, it doesn't matter. Watch the problem now if you're a Jew. And I'm going to read this section now. It just means what it says. And if you're a Jew, you are even in more hot water. Verse 17 of Romans 2. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. Now, if you're not a Jew, you're not going to understand a lot of this, so don't worry about it. Thank God you're not a Jew, even though you're a guilty sinner. Even though you're a guilty sinner going to the same lake of fire the unbelieving Jew's going. Just don't be fretting. Well, I don't understand what he said about the Jew. You're not a Jew, so don't worry about it. But if you are a Jew, you need to be doubly fearful. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. God has some questions for you, you Jew. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest the man should not steal. Dost thou steal, you hypocrite? Thou that sayest the man should not commit adultery. Dost thou commit adultery? You hypocrite Jew, thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? You, you foolish, blind, hypocritical Jew, who, who you as in your nation crucified your Messiah 2,000 years ago. Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God? For the name of God. The name that God gave unto the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles, the other nations of the world, through you, you Jew, as it is written. For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Again, I remind you Gentiles, other nations, you don't understand what I'm talking about, circumcision and uncircumcision, but a real Jew does. You covenant-breaking Jews. Thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, right? Shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee? Look at that, Mr. Jew, or Miss Jew, or Mrs. Jew, or accountable child Jew. 
judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? What do you think, God, who gave his law through Moses to you, the nation of Israel, that, well, we don't have to follow that no more? Ah! What's your claim to fame then, Jew? For he is not a Jew. Watch what God says to you here in Romans 2, 28. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Oh, well, I got the covenant of circumcision. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. Inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men. See, the Jews live for the praise of their own peers, the praise of men, but of God, the praise of God is what you should be concerned about, Mr. Jew. What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. You know, the nation of Israel was given the word of God first, the oracles of God in written form. Their Hebrew Bible that was given through those faithful Men of God in time past, today we are so, so wonderfully privileged to have a completed Bible in the King James Bible in the English language for English-speaking people. But in time past, the Jew had a chief advantage because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. But verse 3 of Romans 3 says, For what if some did not believe? What if some of the Jews didn't believe that their chief advantage was to have the word of God? Shall their unbelief, shall the Jews' unbelief, that he didn't really care about the Bible, make the faith of God without effect? This book is called the faith of God to the Jews and to you Gentiles as well. And will it make it without effect? No, God forbid, yea! Verse 4 again, God forbid, yea. Let God be true but every man a liar. Now, where do liars go? We read earlier, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. But every man's a liar. Now watch this. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Clearly, the Jew is going to switch that psalm around. Don't worry about understanding this, you Gentiles. Most of the Jews don't even get it. The Jews are going to switch that psalm around, and they're going to try and judge God at the great white throne judgment. That is how deceived you are if you're a Jew who has rejected God's salvation in Jesus Christ the Lord. This is what the Jews are going to do at the great white throne judgment. Verse 5, but if our unrighteousness, this is their argument they're going to put forth, but if our unrighteousness, our sin, commend the righteousness of God, if we just make God look better and his righteousness is commended, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I mean, how can God take vengeance on us Jews? Our sin is just making God look that much better. See the parentheses? I speak as a man. Paul is saying, I'm speaking as a man at the great white throne judgment, how the Jews going to go about things. The answer is, God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? I mean, if that's the case, how's God going to judge anybody? If your sin just makes God look that much better. What a foolish argument. Next question the Jew comes up with. For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie... Unto his glory, if our lies and our sinfulness as a Jewish nation who has rejected Jesus Christ just abounds because of my lie unto the glory of God, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, Paul says this now, Paul our apostle says, as we be slanderously reported and as some affirm that we say. Paul was being slandered just like real preachers today are slandered. Evil reports spoken against lies. Watch what they were doing in Paul's day and still do today. Let us do evil that good may come. <laughs> what? The answer is simple. Whose damnation is just. Now, the Jews' damnation is just 
God will take real Jews who have the blood, the physical blood of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob running through their veins, who were God's chosen people in the past that he was dealing with. They're still his people, and he'll end those dealings with him in the seven-year tribulation. But you mark it down. He will throw a Jew with the blood of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in his veins into the lake of fire, just like he will show some throw some Gentile into the lake of fire. These evil tidings now come to a conclusion. It's sort of like court. God has proved that you're sinners. Look now at the ver at verse 9 in Romans 3. If you don't have a Bible, just listen. Romans 3, 9. What then? Are we better than they? Are we Jews better than the Gentiles? The answer is nope. No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. Do you get this? This is the word of God. Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, you are under sin, the condemnation of sin, and everything that comes with that condemnation, you're under. God has, he has proved it. He's proved that you've broken his laws. He proved that at the great white throne judgment, you are going to face indignation and wrath tribulation and anguish upon your soul he has proved that it's a day of wrath he has proved everything and you know he's right quit fighting truth when you fight truth you will lose everything god has proved that they are all under sin now listen diligently to the word of god as it is written there is none righteous. No, not one. You're not righteous. You have broken God's laws. You are unrighteous. If you're broken at one time, you're guilty of all. There is none that understandeth. You don't understand. You don't have any understanding. You have no clue what's going to happen to you when you die. You're going to go to the flames of hell you're going to go then to the great white throne judgment. You will then be cast into the lake of fire. And you don't understand that. Because if you did, you'd be screaming out, what must I do to be saved? But you don't have any understanding. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. All you fake church players out there, and for those who don't go to church, you're all fake. You're not seeking after the God of the Bible that I just presented. And if you think that I'm misrepresenting it and I'm not right, get yourself a King James Bible. Start reading the first three chapters of Romans. All I've done is start at chapter 1 in verse 18, and I've just read up to it, and we're right now in verse 11. I didn't misrepresent anything. I just read what's there. You just don't like it. That's the real truth. Face it. You don't like it. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. You're seeking after the God of Christianity, fake Christianity, that's giving you a God that, oh, he's so loving and kind and all that, and he just has a wonderful plan for your life. That's the God you like so that can coexist and cohabitat and habitate, whatever the word is, with your wicked sin. You just want a God to get along with your sin. Sin has consequences, eternal consequences. There is none that seeketh after God. Look at this. They are all gone out of the way. You're not on that straight and narrow way that leads unto life that few find. They are all gone out of the way. You're on the broad way which leadeth to destruction, Jesus Christ said. They are all, both Jew and Gentile, gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. Don't think you're so special. God says... Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, as a guilty, transgressing sinner against his holy law, you are unprofitable to God. You bring nothing to the table. There's no profit in you. Unprofitable. You have no profit to God. You are no profit to God. There's nothing in you of value. They are together become unprofitable. You said, I don't believe that. I don't care. I just read it. I'm reading it. They are together become unprofitable. God says you're unprofitable. You think you have profit. Now, who's right? You or God? You've got to get to this point. You have to repent. You have to change your mind. You have to believe what I'm telling you here from the word of God. If you do, 
things will go well, and I'll show you. We're almost there. They are together becoming profitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Don't tell me how much good you're doing. God says there is none that doeth good because even all of your righteousnesses, all of your good deeds are as filthy rags before God. And filthy rags, it's just like as if you took your clothes and dipped it in a 55-gallon drum of bloody menstruous flux, bloody, clotty, stinky menstruous flux from women and dipped it in there and put those clothes on stinky, smelly, dripping, and menstruous flux and stood before a holy God and said, I'm okay, I do good. All our righteousnesses, your good deeds, are as filthy rags. That's what a filthy rag is, literally, in the word of God. That's how God looks at your good deeds. So don't be sitting there touting your righteousness and how you're pretty good. You're unprofitable, and there's none that doeth good. No, not one. All your righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That's Isaiah 64, verse 6. If you say, well, I don't see that in Romans. It's Isaiah 64, verse 6, and it applies to you. Go look it up. Their throat is an open sepulcher. A sepulcher is where you bury dead people. It's the stench of death. So don't even begin to think that you can open your mouth in prayer to God to save me. It doesn't work. Prayer is a work. He is not even going to hear your mouth because God will not hear vanity. And we're going to see soon that he tells you to stop your mouth because your filthy, vile mouth, your throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues, they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Don't you dare even think you can open up that vile mouth to a holy God to ask for forgiveness. It's filled with stench and death, and he doesn't even want to hear it. He's going to tell you to stop your mouth. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. You don't know peace. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's a huge problem for you. You don't fear the God of the Bible. Now we know. See, now you know. You can't claim ignorance anymore if you made it this far. I'm at the 52-minute mark on this video. Oh, he's preaching so long. <laughs> so long? An hour or so video compared to Forever in the Lake of Fire? Which is longer? You think this is long? <laughs> if you think this is long, that means you hate truth. Then just turn it off. And when you're in the lake of fire forever, and after you've been there for one billion years, because you rejected an hour or so video, you'll know what long is. Now we know that, now you know, you're no longer ignorant. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. That's you. You're under the law. For the purpose and intent, you know these things. Watch it, that every mouth may be stopped. God says to stop your mouth. Don't listen to the stupid lying preachers who tell you to pray and open your mouth. God says to stop it. You're an unsaved man. You're a lost man, woman, or accountable child. And God doesn't want to hear the prayers of the guilty damned to hell. God hears the prayers of his children, but you're not his child. You're his creation at this point. That every mouth may be stopped. Stop your mouth. Shut up. And believe what has been told to you. And all the world may become guilty before God. Verdict's in. In the land of the living, planet Earth, you are guilty. Guilty. The verdict's already in. Stop your mouth. You're guilty. And don't think now, well, I'll just go and live right the rest of my life. I'll stop sinning and do good. Because even if you did stop sinning and went and did good, listen to the next verse. Now we, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The deeds of the law, you can't go do it. You're not going to be justified in the sight of God by the deeds of law. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. All the law has done is give you a knowledge of sin. And that's the last word and that's the problem. 
So again, in conclusion of these evil tidings, which you must believe, or you will never get your sins forgiven. You'll never be saved from hell. You'll never be justified in the eyes of God because you don't believe the evil tidings first. I conclude again with them. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. Stop your mouth, stop your mouth, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now you know that you're a sinner. Now you know you're guilty. Stop your mouth. If you've done that, God has glad tidings for you now of good things. But now, the righteousness of God that's what you need. Without the law is manifested. God is going to show you how you can have his righteousness. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets agree that this salvation program will work and at the same time will pay off your sin debt and be God will be allowed to give you his righteousness. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. God's faithful only begotten Son. His faithfulness, Jesus Christ, He went to the cross and faithfully paid for your sins. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, that's why God can offer you now forgiveness. He can justify you. He can offer you His righteousness because of the faith of Christ, and it's unto all. He offers it to everyone and upon all them but yet it only rests upon and is imputed upon those and them that believe. Not pray, not ask, believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned, all of us, have we not? Yes. And come short of the glory of God. God defines his glory as all of his goodness, all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But now I'm going to read to you the glad tidings of good things in God's gospel. And God just wants you to believe this message first. That's what you got to believe is this message he's now going to tell you from himself, from God himself, about his son. Look at this. Being justified freely. Right now, God will justify you freely right now, by His grace. Oh, the riches of His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Did you know when Jesus Christ went to Calvary, redemption He bought and paid for, for you. He, redemption is the forgiveness of sins and forgiveness of sins is found in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation. God is setting forth right now to you through His book here in the, the time of which you're watching this video, right now he's setting forth to you the Lord Jesus Christ to be a propitiation. All that means is Christ was made sin for you. Jesus Christ was made sin for you and for me. And God is setting him forth to be a propitiation. That just means he was made sin for you through faith in his blood. God is telling you that he believes the blood of his son paid for all of your sins. That's what God believes. God Almighty, your creator, who is also your judge, believes that the blood of his precious son paid for your sins. You need to repent and change your mind, and you need to believe what God believes. So if God believes the blood paid for all of your sins, you do so. Now, you're not justified yet, but you have to believe that first. So if you've believed in the blood of Jesus as payment for your sin, this is what you now must do to be justified in the eyes of God. Romans 3.26, To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness. God will give you his righteousness, Paul says, that he might be just and the justifier, here's it, here it is, and the justifier of him, that's you, which believeth in Jesus. That's it. So what must you do 
to receive forgiveness of sins, to be given eternal life. What must you do to have God give you his righteousness in Christ? You must believe in Jesus, having faith in his blood. Those two things, you believe the message about Christ, faith in his blood, and that then, after you believe the message, you place your faith, your belief, your trust in Jesus. That's what you do. Very, very simple. Very simple. Okay? Now, let me just make sure that you understand what it means and what the word believe means from God's perspective. You must just simply believe in Jesus, and all believe means is defined for you in Romans 4.21, talking about a man named Abraham and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, what God had promised to Abraham a long time ago, he, that's God, was able also to perform. God promised he'd justify you freely by his grace, through the redemption that is, that is in his great son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He promised you that. He did. He can perform that promise of justifying you freely. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. So you're, you must be fully persuaded because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. When you place your faith in Jesus, your faith is only as good as who you place it in, whom you place it in. And you place it in Jesus after believing in his blood. Fully persuaded, then God will then impute unto you his righteousness. Do that right now. Believe in Jesus. Have faith in his blood. Fully persuaded. No doubt that God will perform what he said he would do, that he would justify you freely, and you will have eternal life as a present possession. Right now, do it. All right. If you've done that, now go to the next page on the website called All Authority. Farewell.